In this video, we examine how to apply osmotic pressure to non-ideal solutions. Right, in the prior video, we have uh, defined what osmotic pressure is, and we have found a relationship between the osmotic pressure of a solution and its molar concentration. Now, uh, there were a bunch of conditions that we actually need to uh, use in that derivation, but they all boil down to just one which is ideal behavior, right? So the question is, well, what happens to our osmotic pressure treatment if you're trying to determine the molar mass of a solute under non-ideal uh, situations, right? So uh, the, the, uh, what we're going to do is something that is quite reminiscent of an approach that we took uh, uh, when we were handling gases, and that is to say that the properties uh, of a gas could be expanded in terms of uh, powers of pressure, that was the, the real equation of state. Here, we can actually use the same treatment uh, and do an expansion of osmotic pressure on uh, increasing powers of the concentration, right? So let's see how that takes place and a little bit more of a justification for it. Okay, so notice that these are the root expressions to, uh, to obtain uh, the molar mass of a substance, right? This is the relationship between osmotic pressure and the molar concentration of that solution. Uh, but then, because we know that the molar concentration is just the mass concentration divided over the molar mass, then we can come up with this expression, which is very easy to solve for the molar mass. Like, this is your unknown, and uh, you determine it from measurements of the osmotic pressure for a solution uh, with a given mass concentration that you prepare, right? So that is 5 grams per liter or 10 grams per liter and so forth. Now, the question is, what happens when you are not under ideal uh, circumstances? Well, so ideality is reached when the concentrations are very low, right? But if your concentrations are, are, are not low enough, then these equations will not apply. So the variable that breaks down the ideal approximation is uh, the molar concentration. So then it's natural to uh, try to incorporate non-ideal behavior by expanding the property that you're interested in, the osmotic pressure, in terms of powers of the variable that breaks down uh, the approximation, which is the uh, molar concentration. Right? So then the, the way that we envision this is to say, well, this is simply just the first term in a series with infinite terms that depend on increasing powers of that uh, molar concentration. Right? So here we can use uh, some constants which I'm going to call maybe uh, C1 uh, multiplied by the concentration of B plus C2 times the concentration of B squared uh, plus, right, you could continue to do this all the way until infinity, right, and that should in principle capture uh, every non-ideal behavior, right, the, the only question is how many terms you include here. The other question then is, well, fine, that, that should work, but how do you determine the molar mass of your solute? That's ultimately what we want to do. Right, so then uh, let's try to see how we can uh, develop this, right? So notice that uh, uh, what we can do is, is exactly the same thing down here, right? So 1 plus C1, but of course we're unfolding this in terms of the uh, model, uh, mass uh, concentration, C sub B, over uh, the molar mass, uh, m, uh, m sub b, and then C2 times uh, mass concentration over the molar mass squared, and all that, right, and more terms. And again, the, these terms are equivalent, right, so the constant molar concentration of b is the same thing as the mass concentration over the molar mass. Okay, so we have to work with this, and again, our unknown what we want to solve for is the molar mass of the solid. So again, how do we do that? Well, the first thing that we're going to do here is simply operate, right? And uh, we can operate by doing the following. C sub B is going to be equal to RT molar mass of B plus C1 times RT CB times the molar mass of B squared plus um, RT uh, C2 over the molar mass of B cubed and then C sub B squared plus all these terms right here. Okay. 
Well, so uh, then what we actually do is represent this, right? Uh, what you do in the laboratory is make various solutions of varying mass concentrations. So this would be maybe one gram per liter, two grams per liter, five grams per liter, 10 grams per liter. And what you do is you measure the osmotic pressure. Right? That's something that you can do. And then uh, what we do, try to do is, is a representation of this, right? So let's see uh, how we actually do this. Notice that you're going to plot this in the y-axis and the x variable is going to be your mass concentration, right? So notice that then, if that's the case, what you're going to have here is a polynomial that looks like this. Uh, this will be a plus bx plus cx uh, squared plus terms. Okay, so let's see if we can actually draw that graph here. All right, so here you have uh, osmotic pressure divided over uh, the mass concentration. And here you're going to have mass concentration. Okay, and again, the goal is to try to find out what the molar mass of the solid is. Well, we're going to examine here various cases. Suppose that we are in the ideal case, and what that means is that the C1, C2, Z3, all those are zero. Okay, so what that means is that your expression actually looks like this. And what then should happen is you should have a line that, does not, that has no slope, right? There's no dependence. Uh, uh, of this y on uh, the mass concentration. So that should be a line of zero slope, right? So uh, that's what you should expect to find if you're in the ideal case. Now, importantly, the intercept with this uh, y-axis, that intercept, intercept is equal to RT over the molar mass of B. Okay, so that's how you determine the molar mass, right? So you, you take these measurements, maybe four or five experiments, right? Uh, and then uh, that uh, intercept is going to be, yes, RT over the molar mass of B. You can fit this uh, and then obtain the molar mass there because you know the temperature on R is a constant. Well, the question is, well, what happens if you uh, have deviations from ideality? Well, so suppose that uh, this C2 is very small, but C1 is sizable. Well, C1 can have, can either be positive or negative, right? So you're going to have their straight lines that are either of positive slope or of negative slope. We're going to draw here a line that is going to be of positive slope, right? Uh, uh, something like that. Okay, so this will be now your measurements. Okay, but notice that uh, you would now be in this case, so you can fit uh, uh, that line, right, with software. But of course, what you want to determine is the molar mass of B. Notice that the molar mass of B is still going to be in this intercept, which is right here. Right? So that's still how you get that, uh, that intercept. You just, you just do it, or that, that molar mass, you just do it from the intercept. And this can work for any other polynomial. So let's suppose that now you're even further away from ideality, and you have that this C2 is not negligible. Right? So you will have a quadratic curve, so there will be some curvature to this in which uh, maybe the way to, to represent it is something like that, where you would have your five points. Right now, there's a second order correction, but again, the key is that regardless of how far away from ideality you are, right, the intercept of all of these lines with the y-axis should give you a handle to determine what the molar mass of that solid is. Okay, so uh, in this video, we have seen uh, ways to do osmometry, which is the determination of molar mass of solutes from osmotic pressures, even in conditions of non-ideality.